I sat down at my computer a couple of weeks ago and I made a quick list. It took me literally five minutes. A list of the various matters that have been brought before me over the last year. Now, these represent statements that have been made to me or versions of questions that have been asked of me or articles that have been read by me over the last, I'll say, 12, 16 months. Now, I'm not critiquing or making fun of anyone who brought these before me. I always appreciate people sending me articles and questions. Please keep them coming. In fact, I personally hold to versions of some of the views that I'm about to list. I'm simply listing matters that have been brought before me as a way of illustrating the diverse number of views that Christ followers hold. Now, these are matters that are very present and very real to many people. I'm calling it the top 20 of 2021. Here we go. Number one, COVID is the result of 5G technology. 5G antennae are spreading the virus. Number two, Bill Gates unleashed COVID as a way of implanting microchips into everyone on the planet so that they could be tracked. Number three, COVID escaped from a lab in Wuhan, China. Number four, COVID was intentionally released from a lab in Wuhan, China by the Communist Party of China as a biological warfare weapon against the West. Number five, the United States military exported COVID to China as a biological warfare weapon against the Communist Party of China. Keep up. Number six, Taking the vaccine is receiving the mark of the beast, as outlined in the book of Revelation. Number seven, Big Pharma produced and released COVID as a profit-making tool. Number eight, you should wear a mask at all times. In fact, if you don't wear a mask at all times, you are harming and even killing the people around you. Number nine, Masks may prevent large droplets from spreading, but they're useless in preventing the spread of microscopic particles of COVID. Number 10, you should never wear a mask at any time since they don't help others, they are essentially COVID theater, and they are actually harming your own health. Number 11, if you follow the governmental guidelines, you are bowing to the enemy and you're failing to trust God. Number 12, you should not only follow the governmental guidelines, but if you truly love people, you'll actually go above and beyond the recommended governmental guidelines. Number 13, vaccine passports are the only sane way forward. Number 14, vaccine passports are a necessary evil. Number 15, vaccine passports are a complete, illegal, unjustified overreach by our government. Number 16, if you support Donald Trump, you are a racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, sexist, redneck cult member. Number 17, if you do not support Donald Trump, you are an anti-Christian communist pinko. Number 18, if you are on the left side of the political spectrum, you hate God, are hurting people by allowing them to become dependent upon the government. 19. If you're on the right side of the political spectrum, you are an intolerant, bigoted conspiracy theorist. Number 20. If you accept that global warming is essentially the product of man's activity and is at a crisis level, you have bought into the biggest lie of the century. And number 21. If you do not accept that global warming is essentially the product of man's activity and is at a crisis level, you have bought into the biggest lie of the century. <laughs> Over our remaining few moments together, I'm going to give you my personal response regarding each and every one of these in an effort to convince you to agree with everything that I believe. I'm just kidding. But over the next remaining moments, I am going to give you the biblical response to each and every one of these issues. It's actually easier to do than you might realize. I can give you the biblical response to this entire list in one simple verse. Here's the verse. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Romans 14, 1. In this one solitary verse, you will find the answer to all 21 of those statements. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. 
Now let's begin by asking and answering a foundational question. What exactly are disputable matters? Well, the word disputable in the original Greek language where it was written means an inward thought. It's the word for a personal opinion. Disputable matters are issues on which the Bible does not give a clear directive. So we're not talking about murder or adultery or lying or stealing. Things like murder, adultery, lying, stealing, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, salvation by grace through faith, these are non-disputable matters. Those are matters where there can be no disputes between Christians, meaning there's a settled biblical response to each of those matters. And if you disagree with those responses, you are outside of Christianity on that matter. But we're not talking about those kind of matters. We are not talking about issues that are black and white, issues on which the Bible gives us clear teaching and clear directives. No, today we're talking about disputable matters. Disputable matters are not black and white. They are gray. A disputable matter is a matter where godly, intelligent people can disagree. In fact, disputable matters are matters where godly, intelligent people can even have completely opposite views from one another. They're called disputable because they're not a matter of right and wrong. They're called disputable because there's room for disagreement. And they're called disputable because you are able to dispute them. I mean, that's what disputable means. They are dispute-able. You can have two godly followers of Jesus who have opposing views on these matters. A classic example of a disputable matter during the first century was the whole issue of meat offered to idols. So you had two different groups of people. People who, before they were followers of Jesus, participated in these pagan ceremonies, and people who had never participated in these pagan ceremonies in the pagan temples. And here's what would happen. In these pagan temples, meat would be used as part of the, the ceremony. You would take some meat, you would place it on a stone slab, and it would be ceremonially offered to some idol. Then that meat, because it was fine, it wasn't burnt or really uh, affected at all, that meat would then be taken to the local meat market and it would be cheaper, half price because it had been used in a ceremony. Now, people, uh, Christ followers, who had never participated in these ceremonies would buy that meat and they'd say, hey, great, no problem, half price, that's a good bang for my buck, sure, I'll, I'll get the cheaper meat, it's good meat, nothing wrong with it except other Christ followers who used to participate in those ceremonies, they'd say, oh wait, time out, you can't buy that meat, you can't eat that meat, no way can you do that, because I used to participate in those ceremonies, that meat was offered in a pagan ritual, a Christ follower can't eat that kind of meat. And so you had this huge battle between eat and don't eat when it came to these uh, ceremonies, and when it came to this meat offered to idols. And Paul was asked to address this. What should we do? What's the right answer? And Paul says, listen, here's what you do. Accept the one whose faith is weak and don't dispute, don't argue over disputable matters. So now what does it mean to accept one another's faith? It means to respect and recognize the fact that the one who disagrees with you is as biblical and is as loved and accepted by Christ as you are. Now, while Paul labeled people on one side or the other uh, when it came to the meat offered to idols issue, he called the faith of one side weaker than the other. He didn't question or deny their faith. He said it's weaker, but he didn't question their faith. Neither did he command the weaker to change their view. In fact, in a letter he wrote to the church in the ancient city of Corinth, famous for its pagan temples, Paul recognized and respected the faith and the consciences of people on both sides of the matter. In his letter, he gave a recommendation as to how to proceed uh, in scenarios where disputable matters could potentially arise. For example, he said this, he said, so then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God and since their conscience is weak, it's defiled. But food doesn't bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do, don't eat and we're no better if we do. 
Be careful, however, Paul said, that the exercise of your rights doesn't become a stumbling block to the weak. So Paul's saying, listen, you and I know, many of us know that it doesn't matter. This meat offered to this idol, it doesn't affect the meat at all. But not everybody realizes this. And some people are so sensitive still in their consciences that they just can't eat that meat without thinking that somehow they're still participating in some pagan ceremony. He said, so just be sensitive to each other, respect each other. In chapter 10 of this same letter, Paul goes on to give some very practical advice. He says, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So in other words, he's saying, listen, when you go into a meat market and, and you're buying some food, just eat it. Don't ask questions, don't ask about it. Everything belongs to God, God created it all. Just go with that as your philosophy, as your foundation, and just go naively and purchase the meat without asking. Let's keep reading. And then he says, now, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. So in other words, pause there. He says, so listen, if you go to somebody's house and you're in a local restaurant or something and they put meat in front of you, he said, don't ask where it came from. Don't say, now, is this good meat or bad meat? Has this meat been offered to an idol or not? Don't even ask. Just eat it. Don't ask. Just eat what's in front of you. Parents, there you go. You have a biblical verse for when you tell your kids, eat what's put in front of you. Let's keep reading. He goes on. But, he says, if someone says to you, oh, by the way, this has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it. Paul says, don't ask, but if they mention it, stop right there and say, I'm sorry, I, I can't eat this. So Paul's advice was essentially this. He says, don't ask and don't tell. But if someone does tell, don't eat, for the sake of protecting the conscience of the weaker brother or sister. He says, don't argue about it. Shut the argument down by shutting your mouth up and heading out for some fast food together. In other words, if someone walks by and sees you in this restaurant eating this meat that's been offered to an idol, they might be saying, hold on, I thought Joe there, I thought Susie was a Christ follower, and they're eating this meat that was offered in a pagan temple. What's going on? I I'm confused. And they're, they're weak in their faith, and he said, you'll harm them. He says, if you find out that it's been offered to an idol, then don't eat it. Don't argue about it. Shut the argument down by shutting your mouth up and heading out for some fast food together. For the sake of the unity of brothers and sisters in Christ, Paul said you should change the menu and change the subject. That's what Paul's alluding to in the verse from Romans 14.1, except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. He's saying, refuse to be drawn into an argument over matters of preference or conscience. Accept that you and your brother or sister see things differently and move on. Now, Paul says a bit more as a follow-up, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But before we do, let's look at a couple of other quick passages that deal with how Christ followers should handle non-essential but divisive issues. Now, Paul is in a mentoring relationship with a young pastor named Timothy. As part of his mentoring, Paul wrote Timothy a couple of letters where he gave some tips on how to handle certain people and certain situations. Paul gave Timothy some signs to look for in ungodly, divisive people. Paul said that such people have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind. Now, look at that phrase, an unhealthy interest in controversies. Do you have someone in your life where you dread it when you see them walking your way because you know that they're gonna get you cornered and grill you over their latest theory or over the latest debate that's raging on TV or the internet? Are you that person? If you are, you need to stop it. You are being ungodly when you do this. You have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind. Now, in a second follow-up letter, Paul once again touched on this subject. He said, keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. 
It's of no value and only ruins those who listen. Now, what does he mean, quarreling about words? What are quarrels about words? Quarrels about words are major disputes over minor issues. To quarrel about words is to divide over something that is not essential. It's to part ways over a split hair. For example, in Matthew 23, 24, Jesus describes some people who strain out a gnat but swallow a whole camel. These people are very selective in the things that warrant their focus. They analyze to the infinitesimal degree the most minor things. They strain out a gnat. While they ignore the more important matters, they're willing to swallow a camel. Now you say, Darren, they may be minor to you, but they're major to me. They may not be essential to you, but they're essential to me. But that's the point. You're making my point. These things are disputable matters. These are matters where people can have differing opinions and place differing weights of importance upon them. So it's not about what you feel is important or what I feel is important. It's about the level of importance that the inspired writers of Scripture placed upon them. They are disputable because they deal with matters that are not specifically addressed in Scripture. There are matters that are not essential enough to be covered by some principle in God's Word. And no matter how important such matters feel to you or feel to me, according to the Apostle Paul, debating about them with other believers is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Now, in another passage from Paul's second letter to Timothy, we read this. He said, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Now hear this. Paul is not saying that every person who asks for your opinion on a disputable matter is a quarrelsome person. Not at all. Sometimes people are sincerely asking because they are in the process of investigating and forming their own opinion. Paul is not saying that it is wrong to ask questions about disputable matters. Paul is saying that it's wrong to debate and argue over disputable matters. Do you see the difference? Paul is not talking about sincere seekers or casual conversations in this passage. Paul is talking about repeat offenders. Paul's talking about the guy or the gal who has settled on their opinion and they're now working to convert others to their view or to get others to be as upset about the matter as they are. Paul's talking about the person who has a stir stick for a tongue. Paul's talking about the person who's looking for a debate. Paul says don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. So, if someone walks up to you and tries to get you to bite on a discussion about a disputable matter, treat them like they're offering you a, a plate of fresh roadkill. Just say, no thanks, I'm not interested. That's what Paul seemed to be advising another leader named Titus. Now, Titus was by Paul's side during some epic battles in Galatia, in Corinth, and in Crete. He seemed to be at Paul's right hand for numerous matters of intense conflict. I mention that because Paul and Titus knew all about the right time and the right place to argue and debate. But even when writing to a battle-tested guy like Titus, Paul reminded him to, and I quote, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Now look what he says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, meaning at the third time, have nothing to do with them. What do you do with a divisive person? Paul appears here to suggest a three strikes and you're out policy. In other words, warn them once that you don't want to get into a debate. Warn them a second time that you don't want to get into a debate. And then if they approach you a third time and start to debate, Turn your back and walk away from them. Hang up the phone. Ghost them on Facebook and Twitter. Don't return their emails unless it's an email of apology. Okay, let's go back to the Romans 14 passage where this all began and quickly unpack it. Let's follow Paul's entire line of thinking when it comes to disputable matters. 
Now, he began in Romans 14.1 and he says this, Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who doesn't. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. Here's the first principle from that. He says, do not deny the faith of another believer or divide with another believer over matters where scripture is unclear. So he says, when it's a disputable matter, do not use a disputable matter as an excuse, as an excuse to divide with another or to deny the faith of another. It's disputable, you're able to dispute it, Godly, intelligent people can disagree. You should never divide or deny someone because of a disputable matter. That's the first principle. Let's keep reading from Romans 14. He says, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord's able to make them stand. There's the second principle from Romans 14. Leave one another and your differing views in the hands of God. God has accepted those who hold opposing views to yours. You're not the master of those who hold opposing views. So just leave them in the hands of God. You're not their master. God's their master. Trust God to work things out in their mind. Okay, let's keep reading in Romans 14. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. There's the third principle. Do your research and determine your position before God. Now, this is crucial. Paul says, listen, dig in. You want to in, uh, investigate on the internet? You want to read books? You, you want to go to seminars? Go for it. Knock yourself out. Do your research. Be convinced in your own mind. There's nothing wrong with researching things that are disputable. Nothing wrong at all. Knowledge is good. Facts are your friends. Get all the facts that you can. Do your research and be convinced in your own mind. Let's keep reading. So what does he say next? He says, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. There's the fourth principle from Romans 14. Assume that others have done the identical thing with the identical motivation. In other words, don't paint your opposition as the ungodly, the less spiritual people. You assume that they have done research like you've done. Now, your research may be better. I'm going to assume it was. You, who, who's going to think that I'll do lousy research and, and I'll let them do the good research? We all think our research is best. Here's the thing. Assume that they have researched just like you have. Don't argue about the quality of their research, though your quality might be much better than theirs. Don't argue about that. Assume their motivation is the same as yours. You're doing it because you want to serve God. They're not doing it because they want to serve God. Your motivation is the same. Assume they've done the research. Assume they love God just like you do. Let's keep reading in Romans 14. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. There's the fifth principle. Leave the judging to God. He's building on this teaching about, you know, uh, you're not their master and they're going to answer to their master. It's not for you to judge. It's not for you to condemn. It's not for you to affirm. Leave the judging to God. He knows their heart. He knows their mind. Let's keep reading in Romans 14. Paul says, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, for them, for that person, it is unclean. Stop there. That's the sixth principle. When it comes to disputable matters, Paul does not impose his opinion upon others. Now, notice that Paul did not take this approach when dealing with non-disputable matters. 
What was Paul's approach to debate and argumentation when it came to different views of the gospel? Non-disputable matters, matters where we have to agree as Christ followers, like the deity of Christ and, and, and how we are saved. Those are issues that Paul went tooth and nail with people he fought. Remember in Galatians, he says, anybody who gives you a gospel different than the gospel you heard from me, let them be accursed, he said. He said, even if an angel came and preached to you another message, may they be cursed. Remember he said about Peter, I confronted Peter to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. So in other words, in those issues that are, are non-disputable, Paul was willing to go to toe-to-toe -to -toe and enforce the proper opinion. But in this issue, he didn't. These were disputable matters. Let's keep reading. Paul says, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, don't let what you know is good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. That's the seventh principle from Romans 14. When your personal opinion becomes a source of division, you are working against God. When you make your opinion on a disputable matter, this issue that divides people, you're actually working against God. So let's keep reading. He says, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. And that is really our big idea from that verse 22. Here's the big idea when it comes to this whole teaching. Do your research, determine your position, and close your mouth. Do your research, determine your position, and close your mouth. That's essentially how Paul sums it up. That's how we should respond to disputable matters. Now, remember the context of all of this teaching. We're talking about how to handle disputable, divisive matters within church relationships. We're talking about the context of interactions between believers. Paul is saying that ministries and gatherings of the church should not be used as a platform for people to haggle over disputable and divisive theories, controversies, conspiracies, and speculations. You say, well, Darren, so where can we debate such things? Think of Paul's advice to the church in Corinth regarding how they were carelessly eating and drinking during their communion services, or love feasts as they were known then. Apparently, they had devolved into a wine-soaked potluck party for the wealthy. And Paul said, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God? So, you want to have arguments about disputable matters? You can do that at home with your family. That's if you want to. I mean, you still shouldn't be argumentative even at home. But feel free to take to the streets and march and protest and have rallies. It's your right, maybe even your responsibility as a citizen. Just don't be debating and dividing over such things in the church. And by church, Paul's not referring to a building, they didn't have church buildings then, but to a body of believers. When you're gathered with other believers, do your best to stay away from discussing matters that you know are disputable. The unity of the body of Christ is precious. It must not be damaged or divided over matters of personal taste or preference. It's really that simple. Hear me now. Broadway Church will not be defined or polluted by disputable matters. We will not be known as the right-wing church, or the left-wing church, or the pro-mask church, or the anti-mask church, or the pro-vaccine church, or the anti-vaccine church. We are a Christ-centered church. That means we will not allow the unity of the body of Christ to be destroyed over matters that are not essential to our faith. Now, listen, if a matter arises in our culture where there is a clear and defined biblical position, we will be a church that boldly stands and boldly declares what that biblical position is. We will do all that we can to believe what Jesus believed and teach what Jesus taught and live like Jesus lived and love like Jesus loved, but we will not be defined or polluted by disputable matters. 
So in conclusion, when it comes to dealing with matters such as vaccines, masks, political parties, the biblical position seems to be this. Do your research, determine your position, and then close your mouth. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that when it really mattered, the issue that is crucial for us, our eternal life, our eternal destination, you made things very clear. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. That God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That's not disputable. You made yourself very clear on that. And I pray for anyone listening right now who has not yet accepted you as their savior, who's not yet accepted that gift of forgiveness in eternal life. Maybe there's someone watching right now and you've been caught up in discussions and debates with Christians and, and, or with family members, and you've allowed those debates to, to lead you off into a, a path maybe resenting the church or resenting Christ's followers. Now listen to me. Let me bring you back to the core, the essential truth where God has made himself very clear. We have been separated from God by our sin. And Jesus came to bridge that gap, to cleanse us and forgive us and bring us back into relationship with God. That's not disputable. That's clear. That's what you need to focus on right now. Put these other disputable matters aside. Focus on your eternal life, your eternal destiny, and what God has done to rescue you. And right now, let me pray with you and for you. If you've not yet accepted this gift, just let me pray for you right now. Pray along with me. God, I acknowledge my rebellion against you. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Change me from the inside out. Take control of my life. Clear my mind. Give me clarity in my thoughts, clarity in my soul. Teach me your ways and help to guide and direct my life from this moment on and help me to forgive others as you have forgiven me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, God bless you folks. Thank you for being with us today as we did our best to touch on this issue of masks, vaccines, political parties. How does the Bible deal with divisive issues? The bottom line is do your research, be settled on your position and close your mouth and then go on in your walk with God, loving others and loving him. I hope we've helped you today in some way. God bless you. Thanks for being with us today.